Hello, everyone. This is Ernie Humphrey, the CEO of Treasury Webinars. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our featured general session, Managing Your FinTech Fear, Automation, AI, Chat GPT, and we'll talk about all these other types of technology. Honored to have here with me the thought leaders related to FPNA tech and Treasury tech, and someone who knows a little bit about APNA, our tech, which is yours truly. So, first, my, one of my speakers is Paul Barnhurst. He's the founder of the FPNI guy. He's really hit the ground running here. He's a practitioner probably over the last six, eight months, maybe year. He's grown his following to, I don't know, 80, 90,000 folks. I've had the opportunity to work with him. When you talk about FPNA tech, when you talk about thought leadership, if you're on LinkedIn at all, Paul is your guy. So thank you, Paul. It's an honor to have you here. And then Craig Jeffrey. Probably needs no introduction. He's a managing partner of Strategic Treasurer. Uh, if you've been in the Treasury space at all, you're familiar with the great thought leadership offered by Strategic Treasurer. If you were at the AFP conference, I'm sure you saw their amazing booth and their content. Uh, the most adoring thing I can say about Craig is I refer my clients to him. And those of you that know me never thought those words would uh, come out of my mouth. So thank you, gentlemen, uh, both for being here. So one of the motivations uh, for my session here was it started happening to me when I started seeing all this chat GPT and AI, and I actually got nervous, which is hard to believe. I was actually getting nervous. I'm like, what's going on? Do I need to pay attention to this? Is this going to change my life? We started hearing some stories like the whole finance profession is going to go away, AP is going away, APR is going away, and we're all kind of freaked out a little bit. So let's go ahead and start the conversation here uh, at really uh, the, the high level. So I'll, I'll go with Craig first. So when you look at the treasury tech space and treasury professionals in general, do you feel that the people you've talked to, and, and this could have changed over time, do you feel they overreacted, didn't pay enough attention, or had a balanced approach? What are your thoughts around what you've seen, people's attitude, and paying attention to the whole tech craze we've seen here? Yeah, well, first, if we're speaking about artificial intelligence and machine yeah. learning, there are several, uh, two ditches, one on each side of the road. One is uh, it's all hype, there's nothing to it. And the right. other is by Wednesday next week, we'll be... <laughs> only working the machines will have taken over everything and so there's a lot of interest in it and and like many things there's hype that goes away and takes forever so if you think of uh issues like ebam in the past like a lot of hype and then everybody had paper-based systems and couldn't interact uh, digitally i guess what i'm saying is um, you know as you think about that and how people are looking at it there's higher rate of adoption um of artificial intelligence artificial intelligence, machine learning through system providers that offer it, you know, and so it's still early days, but uh, people are picking it up more, uh, more rapidly uh, using AI and machine learning. As far as chat GPT or BARD or whatever system people are using, a lot are, a lot of people are experimenting with it. And, you know, what are the applications in, in finance for uh, those types of, of tools and, you know, whether it's uh, helping to complete your KYC work, which some people are doing. Um, I, I think the key thing is people are using it to uh, generate some content that is, uh, I guess, I guess I would say it's like a way better uh, intern. You can send it to do, create a list or do some searching and pull stuff together. And it's, you know, it takes 30 seconds and it's better results than you would get from an intern. It takes a week. You still have to check it. You still have to be careful, but there's there's some uses for it. So I would say that there's there's people that are on the ditch in both sides uh, of the road, and then there's others that are uh, looking, learning, seeing where the applications are, because it's certainly improving significantly. All right. So let me do a quick follow-up. Well, have you done any experimenting on your own, maybe on the personal productivity side? Have you played around with it, with content at all, or have your folks done that at all? I'm just kind of curious since you guys do so much amazing content and there's a lot of wheels moving in your organization. Yeah, we, we've used it more on an experimental basis. We won't put yeah. any, you know, we don't have a private, uh, private use of uh, chat GPT, so we won't put out all our right. content that becomes in the public domain. Uh, but Different groups have done it for outlining or creating some structures to see if that generates ideas. Uh, we haven't had it, we haven't been able to use it to 
recreate the writing we do. Um, that's for sure. But um, you know, we've used and and been experimenting. Okay, great. Paul, um, let me turn to you next and let's uh, change the lens of focus. I'll, I'll, I'll couch it as FPNA because that's easier, but a lot of FPNA finance that kind of molds together. So we get into financial analysts and you can talk to Paul talks to a lot of directors, of finance and finance folks. So from your perspective, uh, what you've seen in the FPNA space, what has been your take on the reaction of others to the technology? Good, overhyped? about the right about the right amount you would expect what do you think there i think you've seen a little bit of everything from you know as craig said right the robots are going to take our job by next wednesday and we'll all be on a universal basic income to just ignore it it's all hype it's been there all along and people don't know what they're talking about i mean i think the reality is somewhere in the middle i think most people are at least tangentially paying attention to it I think some people are playing with it. We're definitely starting to see the vendors spend time with it and come up with their AI strategy. Some have released you know, new things since it's come out, whether it be integrating the language learning module, whether it you know be helping kind of with storytelling or different things like that. So I, what I generally tell people is, look, at a minimum, you should be aware of it. Don't expect your job to what, go away tomorrow. Don't expect everything to be you know, different. It's going to take some time, especially the enterprise working through the privacy, the security, the bandwidth, the cost, you know, development, for it really to be enterprise solutions that sits on everybody's desktop. That being said, I think everybody should at least be spending some time playing with some of the tools out there and getting familiar with them. But, you know, like Craig kind of mentioned, and this is what I always caution people, don't put your company's data in the tool. Just don't do it, right? If you wouldn't put it out on the internet or you wouldn't want it on the front page of the paper, then don't stick it in the tool. And so I think that's a little bit of a limit right now for some people, but I've definitely, you know, personally seen a lot of use cases. I've used it in a number of different places in my, you know, in my work and I use it probably on a weekly basis and it definitely helps you know, with a lot of different tasks to streamline things. All right, so can you give us just a few tasks that you've seen because sometimes we get mixed bag yep just give me a little feedback on content maybe modeling where do you see it that it's really yeah, where, where i think it's really helpful right now is not so much on the modeling i'll say there's probably two yeah. or three areas one that helps a ton for me is hey if i have a transcript and i wanted to summarize something right. really good like all the podcast episodes i do it's great at that really helpful for writing an email like you give it a general email ask mm -hmm. it to rewrite it or to clean it up and it does a really good job there. On the data side, two areas I've seen it helpful. One, it can be really helpful in creating data. So if I'm preparing for a course or I need just some dummy data for something, it's great for that. Just ask it to create it. I've also used it to analyze some companies more around showing people what the use cases could be. So like giving it uh, the financials and asking it to tell me the ratios using code interpreter mm. in this case with chat GPT. Or, you know, asking it to analyze the data set, particularly, again, with code interpreter versus just a learning module where it writes some of those Python. There's a lot of, uh, you know, pretty cool analysis you can do. I've also found it's pretty good of, hey, I give it a basic data set. Tell me what graph I should use or mm -hmm. help me write the formula, things like that. Okay, great. Thank you. So obviously, we'll delve into all these topics uh, a lot more and get into some specifics uh, for me. Um, I'll, I'll give my perspective on the AP and AR technology space and the AP and AR professionals. So what I've seen is, is I've seen an appetite to at least learn about it, which is good. And even with Treasury and FP&A, I would say until, I don't know, five years ago or so, we were very lagging and there didn't seem to be an appetite for the technology. So regardless of all the, but I see the scary things about chat GPT, I think it was really good in getting people's antennas up. So that's the first step. Now that we got their antennas up, let's get those things kind of tuned in a little bit because those antennas have been down forever. So I don't think I've ever seen those up. So it's good. It's good to have that. And as far as the technology is concerned, I think we've already started to see that a little bit more, even than an FP&A and Treasury uh, taking place, which is kind of strange for leading the way for me. It's been a long time. AP has been going on a long time. AR is kind of 
caught up to that, but I've seen that. So we'll get into this later. My my advice for folks in general or the technology space is understand it, but it's already here. It's coming in your solutions. So understand it, but and for me, this is my opinion, you can learn to do Python and become a data scientist and all that good stuff, but if you're working with the right partners, and we'll talk to Paul about this later, especially that PNA space, space, the smaller solutions are incredible on the forefront of technology that they're bringing uh, to the game. So I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of at, I see, I see them maybe in the right space. They got their antennas up, so that's good. But I'm trying to help them not go on the other side of the ditch, uh, as Craig, as Craig would put it. So it gives us a little overview here. So let's dive in a little bit more. We kind of touched on those uh, a little bit. So I like to do that reverse order. Um, so Paul, we touched on this a little bit. So let's just touch on maybe what you're seeing already um, in the FPNA solutions and what you see as the opportunity for other functionality that matters to develop there that, that you're see them, seeing that works already or people are paying attention to it. Yeah, so I think the first thing you've seen with these tools is basically implementing the language learning module inside the tool and training it on the data, whatever data sets available in the tool to quickly bring it back. You know, I think that's the most basic use case. You know, learning modules are not great at math, as we've all learned, if you've seen all the uh, wrong answers they'll give. And so that's an area I think some of these FPDA tools are struggling a little bit with is have to be very curated in how they train to make sure the numbers they're bringing back are from the system, not calculated by the tool. Because the last thing you want to do is give wrong data, right? So I think that's the first area we're seeing the FPNA software. Then you're seeing it go you know, a step further. I've seen some that have built a tool that helps you tell the story. They've kind of built their own presentation software within it. And it starts to select the graphs and, and write the story. Then you got to go ahead and edit it because... You know, rarely does the tool have the context unless you give it to it to be able to, oh, the reason it's down is three, these three salespeople. Sure, it could look at it sometimes and say, hey, vendor A missed by this amount or vendor B, but it can't go much deeper than that. You know, then in addition to that, you are seeing, you know, some, some other use cases come up. I've seen one that's trying to use it to help build your, build your model, you know, some things like that. But I think we're a little ways out beyond the, kind of the basics at this point to really get deep because there's a couple challenges. One, you got to have clean data. And how many companies really have good data? There's that prerequisite of really your data. Then you got to start small and kind of from build from there and make sure it's working. You know, as Craig mentioned, it can often be much better than an intern, but it still needs to be checked, right? You can't just blindly take the data and throw it in a report and hope it's right. You can, but I wouldn't recommend it, put it that way. And can you give us a little bit of a, and I'm just speaking for myself, I kind of have a very vague knowledge, a little bit of what language learning module means just for the folks on the audience that might not quite be in, up to speed on that quite yet, including me. Yeah, so I mean, basically what a language learning module is, is it's, it's, it is a form of AI Mm -hmm. that is trained on a large amount of data. I think ChatGPT4 was trained on, I think it was hundreds of billions. ChatGPT5 is expected to be trained on over a trillion data points. So it's fed a lot of information. There's a lot of coding behind it to give you know context and logic to that. And then as it gets more and more information and more feedback, it's a trained model where it continues to improve its answer. So okay. some people almost think of it like an intelligent parrot. It can parrot back what it's fed. It can figure out where to use it, when to use it, that type of thing. And so that's really what a, a language learning module is. And it's one force, one you know, form of AI, right? It's generative AI. So that'd be Bard, Chat GPT, Llama is Facebook's version. Um, Amazon just heavily invested in Anthropic, which is Claude AI. So, you know, there's four or five modules out there. Then there's a lot of tools that are using one of those language learning models right. to build their software on. Okay. So for me, I just kind of processed that and said, it's learning, it's creating what I would say a more informed answer. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but there's still, 
non-quality data, but the more information that it gets, it's, it's becoming a more informed answer or better resources. Of course, like you mentioned, which I think is important that people don't say enough is it's from what I know, it's really important that you give it the right prompts and the right context. And when you give it yes. the right context, the output is a, is a game changer from the quality it, that it, you it, see. It definitely can be. It's very important. That's why you hear the term prompt engineer. You know, over time, right. that will get better and better where we can speak to it. Right now, the more context, the more specific you are, the better the answer is going to be. The less context, the more generic your answer will be and the less valuable. So yeah, it, it thrives on context. You, you know, one um one thing on the the, the context and the the learning, the learning process. Um, if you think back on you know, some of the chess computers that were playing, you had uh, people loaded all the games of the grandmasters and built these powerful engines. And then you got to the point where you had the the learning engine. They they had the computer play itself. And I can't remember how many millions of times it played itself in nine hours. But in nine hours, you know, when it first came out, it uh, it then beat the previous program, like 72, 72 wins to like 28 ties or something like that. And it was because it could play millions of games in nine hours because it could generate all of that itself. Mm -hmm. And now it has to learn from feedback. You know, so I was asking, uh, I was like, what's going on with uh, ECR rates over time, earnings credit rates or, or reserve yeah. requirements? When did they change? Give me references. And it puts the stuff out. I'm like, I know it was 15%. I don't remember anybody's name in the world, but I remember that it was 15% of the time. And I said, why doesn't it show that? Like, wasn't it 15%? And then the thing says, sorry. And then it it adds in, it found, it searched a little bit more and found it and then added it in there. So it required a human to send it back to go look a little bit more. Yep. So the learning process isn't nine hours. It's going to be, you know, nine months or, you know, 19 months or whatever it is. But it 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 gets smarter each time. When I feed it back, I'm sure the next time someone plugs it in, they're like, oh yeah, I know that stuff. Uh, and I can learn. So that training is, uh, it, it's really powerful. Great. So since you, um, I appreciate your comment, Craig. So let me, let me turn the focus on your side a little bit. So we talked about, you know, some of the technology that we've already seen, or you're getting an ear that it's coming. Uh, it, were there any areas in treasury that you're seeing uh, momentum? I mean, is, is, ca is it cash forecasting? Is it more? Is there other things that you see coming that are, working or at least in there. Yeah. I, and I would say just pulling back on finance really briefly, yeah. when you look at, uh, yeah. when you look at auditing, uh, you know, all of the, the rooms full of auditors for second, third year people, they're very small. Now it's people running the tools to scan and pull the data. There's nobody looking at them. And so that's changed jobs very significantly. there, very uh, intensely in treasury. They're very thinly staffed and, there's, there's this issue, let's say with forecasting, which is one of the top areas of right. people using AI and machine learning is that they want to do more forecasting. They spend the most time on it. They would spend more time. It's a key area of focus. They're willing to invest in it. And so forecasting, you know, this pattern detection is really uh, something where more and more companies are doing it. And a number of the providers have built these tools to help learn it, to run different models, to help it learn, to help it do better. Uh, that's helping in treasury. That's helping. You see that in AR systems mm -hmm. um, and it's doing it, you know, at a very detailed level, you know, individual company behavior, as opposed to taking just statistical averages, which is what we were restricted to in the past. So um, that's a, that's a key area. So, you know, the patterns there, uh, the, the activities, you know, machine learning in particular is good at detecting patterns. And so where do you think that's useful. It's for fraud. What's out of the ordinary, and also quality control. But mm, but yeah. in Treasury, it's more concerned about fraud. What's going on with these payments? Okay. Something right. out of the ordinary. So those those are the two top areas for Treasuries: forecasting and fraud right. detection. Okay, great. Yeah, you touched on it, you know, a little bit. And from what Craig and I, we've both seen, I'm sure in AP and AR, uh, just the efficiency um, on the AP side. It just helps you learn when there's common mistakes, helps with the geo coding, helps with the time that people spend on non-value tasks on the AR side. 
is starting to predict behavior, spend patterns, where should you spend your time? How should you reach out? How often should you reach out? How do I incentivize uh, the right behavior from our customers? And so I think if used correctly, it helps give people more time to focus on the relationship side, which we will certainly uh, touch on later. Um, so, so let's just kind of cut to the chase a little bit and we'll dive in a few other areas. So from your perspective, Paul, uh, you know, I'm, I guess I'm not, I'm not an FP&A expert. What it, what is it that I should be paying attention to? If I'm, if I have FinTech fear, what are the couple things that you would give me advice so I don't overwhelm myself and trying to learn everything at once? Yeah, I, I think there you almost have to break it into two groups. There's okay. this whole generative AI, the language learning modules. On that, my advice is continue to experiment them, continue to learn about them, prepare for them. I think in general, most companies aren't ready to implement them at an enterprise level. So if there's places you can use it without giving it your data, go ahead. I think when it comes to more of the machine learning, the forecasting, I do think we're there and I think companies should be looking for ways to better implement that. And I'll give two examples. Microsoft has Fin. They use it throughout their company. And most of the time it's more accurate than the humans forecast. You know, and uh, another is, you know, Facebook. They built the one called Profit. They're both open source. They're out there. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity and studies have shown this, you know, fp Trends, their annual survey from 2022, I haven't seen all the details on the 23 one, but the 22 one, you know, the improvement in a good to great forecast, if you were learning machine learning, went from 39% to 61. So I think, you know, using that human judgment with the machine and with these algorithms and with statistics and, you know, different things to help forecast, companies should be looking for ways to do that. Again, you need enough data and there are some challenges, but companies should definitely be looking more and more towards that while keeping a close eye on what's going on with generative AI so that they're prepared as it continues to roll out. Okay. So let me, let me follow up there and get a little bit, a little bit more specific and then we'll, we'll go back to Craig. So if I'm an fp a professional analyst and I'm wanting to look at the C tech stack or my CFO wants to look at the tech stack, um, I know that you work with uh, some guy that we know called Anders um, on the third generation FP&A tools market guide. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that is and then what other tools that you would suggest that people use to kind of stay on top of their FP&A tech games? Maybe a few people that you follow even. Yeah, so definitely we'll share a little bit of that. So first, I'll go ahead and start with a few people I follow, yeah. particularly in the AI and technology space. They're really good. Adam Shilton, I follow him on LinkedIn. He also has a podcast tech in finance that he does. Um, Glenn Hopper is great. He speaks quite a bit. He's written a book about corporate finance and deep learning. He's tested chat GPT, he has a lot of great resources out there. And then I'll mention two others real quick. Christian Martinez, he uh, does data analytics for Heinz. He has a course out there on advanced uh, chat GPT and AI. And he also teaches it along with Nicholas Boucher. So there's a few people out there. Those four, I think, are great ones to follow that have put in a lot of time and are already right. providing courses to help companies figure out how to learn AI. Now, when it comes to the market guide, so last year we released what we call the third generation market guide, which is really focused on these newer tools that have come out in the last few years in the FP&A space. We highlighted 15 tools. We're working it on it again this year, and we'll highlight roughly 15 tools again, slightly different data set. And what that really does is it helps companies understand what's new in the marketplace, what's out there beyond just what Gartner and Forrester and a lot of the big players are focusing on. Particularly if I'm a smaller company, it's really helpful to see what's out there that may work for the tech stack. And we're seeing all of them you know, try to figure out their AI strategy. And over time, we'll see them implement more and more. And so I think that's a great place to look to see things that are out there and to talk to people because the reality is today's technology is not yesterday's technology. Things have changed enough that you don't need to go with the tool you've gone with for the last 20 years. Doesn't mean it may not be a good tool and it may be the right tool for you, but you really need to look out there beyond just 
what you've always historically looked at because there's a lot of good options and it's getting better and better. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for doing that because I love Gartner and Forrester and Juju Card or whatever, mm -hmm. but we really need to look beyond that, especially in emerging tech, because I know, Paul, how many solutions have you looked at over the past two years? Hundreds? <laughs> my many, my I mean, spreadsheet has 140 yeah. just FP&A tools, not counting best yeah. of breed and other stuff. Yeah, so it's important that we we need to follow people to have their pulse on what's coming because that's going to drive the innovation and give us other parameters to look at. So uh, thank you for doing that. Anyone on the call, if you would like a copy of the third generation FP&A market guide, happy, happy to do that. Also, Paul has an amazing forecast. Um, how many follow, how many listeners do you guys have? Now give us a little on your so, podcast. So yeah, so, you know, LinkedIn, I have about 80,000 followers. I have two podcasts, yes. FP&A Today. We're doing about, we'll do close to 17,000 downloads this month. So, you know, we get two to 3,000 listeners to each new episode. Yeah. And then I have a second podcast called Financial Modelers Corner, and that one's up to about 6,000 a month. Okay, great. So, Craig, uh, let me put the spotlight um, over to you now. So let, let's get back to the to the technology. So uh, I know that you always do a great uh, technology survey. And this year you partnered with one of my other partners on the event, TIS, and some a lot of interesting results. Share with us some of the areas where you saw specific areas of innovation that people are kind of grasping onto already, which surprised me in all honesty. Well, there's there's quite a bit. So the Treasury yeah. Technology Report, um, you know, some of the areas that I would say stood out or maybe a particular yeah. interest to your audience here is, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And not just that it was important that people were paying attention to it, because I think we don't have to have a survey to know that people right. have been paying attention to that. Um, but if we look at, you know, larger companies versus smaller companies, you know, 81% see it as important now and or soon versus 63% of wow. smaller or medium companies. So that's a you know 18 point spread. So larger companies are paying more attention to it. I don't know exactly why that is. Um, why that larger company, you know, we can't ask questions about questions about questions. Mm. But right. larger companies are more tuned into that. Um, and it might be that there's just more uh, more uh, opportunity there. But if you look at, uh, if you also look at the particular uses for AI, machine learning, pattern detection, Europe is quite a bit ahead of the U.S. in terms of its view mm -hmm. of importance. So if you look at um, importance for fraud and control, uh, Europe, 93% say it's important now or soon will be. And 70, 71% uh, in the rest of the world, which is heavily North America. That's a 22-point spread. But first of all, don't miss the headline. It's not that Europe's awesome. It, they are. Um, you know, Even the lowest area is 71% say it's important now or soon. So all of, the you know, all of our peers that are listening to your cash management uh, tech uh, demo day, Almost everybody, you know, if you're if you're not interested in it, and you have three friends, they're all interested, and you're the one that's out. If you're in Europe, right. it's uh, you know, you're one of fourteen that's not interested in it. So that was that was one of the the key things earning. Um, the other is uh, the other is probably less boring or more boring, less right. interesting, is a doubling of payment factories for small and medium companies. Mm. I know that's not that may not sound like the artificial intelligence, but. <laughs> But it's very practical, you know, the growth of fraud, the threat of fraud, the new payment rails that are coming out, um, you, you know, that you know, the ability of the technology to go to smaller companies to be affordable. And we like to use the term democratization of treasury tech, democratization of payment tech. It's coming down. Uh, so that's a that was really pretty interesting to me. Um, the if you want one more, I'll give you one more. Sure. Absolutely. So we asked what was what was most important in a couple of areas um, in, in terms of what people are focused on. 45% wanted to limit IT disruption. So if we talk about and think about the concept of uh, democratization of technology, easier to stand things up, 45% want to limit IT disruption, which leads towards cloud native, some of these newer tools like you know some of the things that you know, Paul's discussing as well. 
um, enriched formats, which is a, you know, treasury operates in a global world outside their borders, not just internally, and 40% favored enriched formats. And then interesting to me, at least, maybe not to, maybe only to four other people in the world, is that it's dropped down to 15% um, that was most important, not changing connections that are working. That used to be like 40 oh, yeah. something percent. Yeah. Because why would you rip something out if it's working? Well, it's getting more and more people are seeing those as, as priorities. And if they can connect in a simpler way that gives them more enriched information, they're willing to move. That movement was quite a bit. And that um, that made me have to think about that one quite a bit, how uh, how that's uh, that's changing an environment because information is power. You know, as uh, you know, Paul was maybe he didn't use those words, but he was basically saying the ability to harness that information is power. And this is we need more information. We have the tools to manage it. So uh, those those are some of the things that, mm. that stood out with uh, the research we did yeah. with CIS. So so let me let me dovetail a couple of things. We're gonna that we're in, we're gonna have have a little what I call uh, the fun time here. So we've seen this for a long time. The appetite for technology, whatever it might be, even payments, electronic payments in Europe is still, I don't know, miles higher. Uh, Craig, why why do you think this is still the case? Do you think we're getting better? Or there's, do you have any thoughts on one why it exists, but two what we can all do together to help that? Is there anything that we can do? Do you think as people that are thought leaders? Well, I think I think I think we're getting there. Um, you know the the complexity that you know if you have a treasurer and they're in Europe, if, you know if you go back even thirty years ago, they're dealing across borders. You get to a certain size mm-hmm. and you're across border. You can be a half a billion turnover company and you're in five countries or 10 countries, whereas you can be a $5 billion company and operate solely within the U.S. So by, you, you were forced to deal with all kinds of additional complexity, mm-hmm. multiple currencies, multiple countries, multiple banking systems. You had to be more well-versed to do that. Mm-hmm. Ongoing globalization is making more, let's say North American companies become far more global. That's forcing better behavior, um, you know, uh, and and so that's uh, I think that's that's the complexity is pushing more people okay. in that direction. Um, so I think that's probably the first uh, first thing. Paul, what are your what are your are you seeing the same thing in the FP? And I'm not versed in that. Uh, it seems it's it's also the case in FP and A. We've seen more of an appetite for even things like actually doing, this is old news, but actually doing rolling forecast and dynamic forecasting. Have you seen that as well? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things you've seen over the last few years is a much bigger appetite to understand cash within FP&A, you know, and if there's a treasury department, you need to be working really close with treasury. Sometimes if you're a smaller company, right, treasury, FP&A controller, they're almost always one, yeah, it can sometimes be one person in a really small company, but the larger you are. So I think that's one thing. The second thing you've seen is a much greater desire for more frequent forecasting, whether that be rolling forecasts, whatever that might be. But in addition to that is scenario planning, right? That's substantially increased, right? COVID caused everybody to rethink the way they forecasted when all of a sudden your business either exploded, collapsed, or nearly collapsed, right? There weren't a lot in between. And so I think that really changed a lot about how people think about things. And that's something all these tools are really focusing on is making sure one, you can do an integrated three statement model easily. You can scenario plan easily and do what if, because there's a difference between a scenario and a what if. I think sometimes people get them confused. Scenario, okay, what am I gonna do in a recession? What am I gonna do if this government regulation happens, right? There's something behind it. It's a use case where what if is more looking at it and saying, okay, if inflation, if prices go up 2%, what happens to go down 2% and you're running different variables and just seeing how sensitive your business is to changes of different variables. Right. So you teed up the next topic I'll get to Paul, but I wanted to weigh in a little bit on AP and AR. So those folks, what I've seen, I mean, just like anything else, probably until, I don't know, even five years, if that there's always been viewed as a, Cost of doing business, transactional, no strategic role, no strategic value. And then what happened, it actually started before COVID, the technology, I started seeing that in AP automation solutions. So that was kind of a good thing for COVID. If you look at the growth in a lot of these solutions mm-hmm. and during COVID, it was 
off the charts. And so I think that kind of whetted the appetite quite a bit for these folks to wake up. And then I also think it was good for people to say, oh, maybe I want to redefine my value proposition here. Wouldn't it be fun if I'm not arguing with suppliers all the time, if I'm not entering data, if I'm not you know, doing all these mundane things, and I have a career, and AP is an awesome career. However, now you've got the business knowledge to go into other things. Maybe you want to be the control. Maybe you want to be the CFO. Maybe you want to go into business partnering. So I think that's what I would add. So one of the things that Paul just, Craig and I, I think we both kind of laughed, you said, if there's a treasury department, now treasury people, you would say, if there's an FP&A department. So kind of jokingly, <laughs> but I want to get your perspective. So Paul and I joke all the time. Um, about FP&A and Treasury and what's more important. So from your perspective, Paul, why do you think this kind of this, I think there's still tension there. Do you have any thoughts on why you think this exists and what we can do? Because the forecast is cash and forecast, and there seems like there's still this disconnect and I still don't quite get it. I mean, I think sometimes what happens is FP&A is like, well, we handle planning and Treasury yeah. trying to manage things. And I, I think some people it's often just a fear of somebody else taking their job, not wanting to collaborate. We always see that people holding information close to the vest, the best companies and the best situations, they partner, you know, I was fortunate to have that situation at American express where I worked very closely with treasury all the time. Cause I uh, managed travelers check. And so we had a 2 billion liability oh, wow. that yeah. we invested right of all that float. And so we had to work very closely with treasury on that and regular meetings and that helped me really gain an appreciation and value for having a good treasury department to work with and to go to and have those conversations. But I think that's how it needs to work. But I, sometimes there's always a fear of, hey, are they encroaching on my territory? Which generally nobody wins when we have that attitude, but it's human nature sometimes. Yeah. Craig, let me let me get your thoughts. I know you've seen this a long time and just want to get you to weigh in here before I do. Yeah. So, so when I think of, we use a lot of the same terms and mean different right. things. So a forecast is a forecast is a plan. And, you know, what's, what's the focus of the FP&A plan? It's usually, it's usually income. It's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's income statement related. The, the treasure is focused on the balance sheet and those are, you know, you're like, Hey, they have to reconcile at some point, but th those are very different focus. And in the treasury world, there's the short-term forecast. What do I have to meet my needs as they come due on a daily, weekly basis, maybe out yeah. up to a year. And then treasury looks out, uh, also has to look at what does my balance sheet need to look like three, four, five years? Uh, what do I need to do to get the type of funding? That's that's different, but we use some of the same terms as uh, you know, what, what Paul's talking about. It's like, you know, as you look at the FP&A, you've got to know how you're going to make money and profit. And you're looking at in chunks of time. And so there's this, there's a tension within Treasury too of the short-term forecast versus long-term mm -hmm. balance sheet planning. Just like there could be a tension of when someone says, hey, FP&A and Treasury, your forecasts are different. You got to reconcile those two. It's like, <laughs> really? You're going to reconcile those? That'll be fun. And then you start talking about <laughs> float and other stuff until they get tired and you know the next uh, issue is taking their attention off of it. Yeah, to me, I mean, it's easy to say Monday morning quarterback because I'm not in those weeds and not weeds, not in that space anymore. Uh, it's almost a, a cultural thing, right? I mean, and I don't know how to how to overcome that, but it seems like there's just a culture. But what I'm seeing and what I'm going to talk a lot more about in the next year or two is collaboration, communication, what the value of that is. So I talk about your human skills value the skills that no matter where technology pulls us or takes us, we still need the human intervention. We still need to collaborate. We still need to do these things. And so as people see that and see the value and the appetite of that needing to be part of their value proposition. And you mentioned this earlier, Craig, when you were talking about uh, in Europe, right? If you, if you need to do it, if you're exposed to it, if you're expected to do it, you're going to do it, right? You have to, you know, to be successful, to meet your challenges and be, you know, be the, person that you want to be in terms of offering uh, offering value uh, to your company. So many amazing topics, Craig. I know you want to get in there. I'll, I'll hit you up. So Craig, I want you to make your comment, but I also was remiss. I want to know, besides me, who you look to to kind of stay on top of your treasury game. <laughs> yeah. So so a couple of things, um, yeah. you know, I look at uh, on the payment side, I'll, I'll often, from a podcast perspective, I'll listen to yeah. 
the payments podcast by bottom line and, and that robot who makes the announcement uh, for that. I, I love it. That's uh, that's one of the ones. I also like Digital Dump, uh, which doesn't come out as much as I like it because it talks about tech uh, and the finance area. Those are those are a couple of the, the, the consistent ones that I that I listen to. Um, I try to read stuff on fraud from a cyber fraud perspective, not just from a treasury perspective. Um, I'll read tech. I'll download journals, reports from everybody who puts things out from here and there, um, because you can pick up ideas that apply to your space that nobody's talking about because they've got it more advanced in whatever botany or whatever the area is. And you're like, oh, maybe there's something that can be done here. Um, if you can just read and listen to smart people solving issues by you know putting two ideas together or looking at the new tech, those are uh, those are the areas that get my synapses yeah. firing. Can I, I, I just want to bring this up because I, this is a personal belief. I really believe this. So uh, there's a great website for content and conversation uh, that strategic treasurer is in charge of called CTM file. And there's a, there's a lot of focus in all the whole globe, but they really get into what's going on in Europe. And that's really on the cutting edge. Could you give us a little bit more about, what you guys are doing in the content area to help bring issues to everybody across the globe and how they can get involved in that. Well, sure. Thanks. Thanks for mentioning that. So ctmfile.com uh, is a treasury media site. It's part of the you know treasury news network that we, we want to put out content on. So we acquired that a uh, little over two years ago from Jack large and it puts out, you know, daily summation of what's going on in the, the, the treasury space, global economics, and then there's uh, more and more interviews and content demos of what's occurring. And the reason has the word file is that was Jack's uh, brilliant idea of, hey, you keep putting good content in there. People can search and find stuff. Not everything's a headline today, but you need to find uh, items there. So you'll find video. We're doing a lot more video and guest uh, guest editors for that. So um, there's a, a weekly newsletter that you can sign up for. It's only once a week um, that it comes out, so it won't spam you to death. Um, but but thanks for mentioning that. That's a, that's a lot. Of, it's a lot of work and a lot of fun. How about that? Great. So thank you so much, both of you, for taking the time with me. I know you guys are both extremely busy. So uh, thank you, Craig, not only for today, but for being a partner of mine and Paul as well. So I first want to thank you both um, for that. Appreciate that. And then I also want to let everyone know we have plenty more content coming from your cash management tech demo day. I hope you're very much enjoying your experience. If not, please let us know what we can do better. And finally, of course, make the rest of your day great, everyone, which it will be if you spend it in cash management tech demo day.